This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, welcome again to another edition of the Tesla Owners Online Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. I want to bring in my usual guests. Yes, Eric is waving. Yes, Eric Camacho is here and so is Ian Pavelko. Hi guys, how are you doing tonight? Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. <laughs> well, Count Chocula showed up now too. How's about that? We got the whole crew. <laughs> one, one. Wow. Video. You know, it was funny because I was, uh, as I was just talking to you guys before the show, I was thinking, you know, that's not a lot of Tesla news this week. And now all of a sudden, just things could just kind of exploded. So never say that. It, it, well, you know, it just we'll is. It. Uh, uh, also, I want to say thank you to everybody who submitted your questions for later on in the show. We'll get to that. Thank you for taking time during the day to submit your questions. We love answering your questions. Uh, before we do that, though, we have some stuff we want to get into the show. But first of all, Ian has a little bit of a recap because uh, you tweeted out a few days. Was it on the weekend you went to an autocross event? I did, yeah. I mentioned that um, just quickly on uh, last week's show that I just signed up for uh, an autocross, better sometimes known as a solo event, a slalom or a gymkhana, however you prefer. But basically one of these things where you're racing around between the cones. And uh, yeah, I went out and did that on Sunday. Was it fun? It was tremendous fun. Um, was I any good? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I. It was shocking. Stick I, I mean, to winter you know, rallying, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it isn't that. You know, I used to be pretty decent at it, if I do say so myself. Uh, when I used to do this 30-odd years ago with my GTI and my Miata, and I, I brought home my share of trophies. I was okay. And so I thought, ah, how hard could it be? You know, show up. This car is like 500 times faster than anything that I've had before. It's got to be good. Well... Let me tell you a little story, friends. When you have a car that's that fast, that weighs two full tons, it's a handful. I would sort of liken the experience of um, autocrossing a P3D. It, it's like taking a really fast racehorse and trying to do laps of your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Even you know, with track mode. Even with track mode. Yeah, exactly. It's like the turns come at you really fast and the horse, he's not too happy. <laughs> he wants to run. Like, you know, he wants to go to Belmont or some such place. He's not hmm. really interested in going around the backyard. So that's a little bit what it felt like. Now, I have no um, illusions that I, I was up to the task because it, there's a lot of racing around a, an autocross course is very different from lapping or even driving fast on the street because everything happens in microseconds. Like your reflexes have to be super sharp. And half the battle is it's a visual puzzle because you're not really seeing the outline of a track. Like if you've gone around a regular racetrack or quickly down a country road you can see the edges of the road you can see the edges of the track it's very clear in your mind where you know the apex is where your entry point your exit point your breaking point with this half of it is in your head because it's just cones right mm -hmm. so you know especially at this at my age you're kind of like where's the cone where's the cone oh left right you know like you just want to stay on the right course so drawing that takes a lot of practice so you know hats off to the kids who are good at it because um yeah i uh, i got a lot of catching up to do so is, this, I, is this something you can take a course to improve yourself with? And maybe if you drive with a professional or something? Well, yeah. What's nice is this, the club that I was uh, with for the day, uh, CADL, Club uh, Autosport de Laurent Cid, um, had a lot of volunteers on staff. They'd sit in the car with you and they'd guide you through the course. Of course, me showing up like, ah, pff, you know, I know what I'm doing here. Don't worry, kid. Uh, I'm all, yeah, right. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't quite make a fool out of myself. Like I wasn't completely off course. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, the best I could do is mid-pack. Like, I was basically, you know, getting my behind handed to me and kids and <laughs> yattas and minis and whatever all else. So, uh, yeah, size matters in this case, and too big isn't, isn't helpful. Um, what was cool, though, is we had four EVs out, and that's the first time they'd ever had any electrics out to the event. We had four of them. We had three Model 3s. We had... Um, Pierre Shampoo, who you know, who oh, makes yes. the uh, who makes the uh, the little lift pads. Yeah, little pucks there. Yeah, very cool guy. Um, a retired engineer who used to work at actually the um, Transport Canada Research F Facility (PMG). So we had a great time hanging out. He's he's got a, a silver dual motor, and uh, we had Robin. I'm 
Rabin, I should say, I forget his last name, who came out. He had a P3D as well. So um, we we all had a lot of fun. And then we had um, a gentleman um, join us with a, a Bolt. And, really? Uh, yeah, and he did all right with that. His times were not far off ours. He's within a second or two of, of what we were cranking out in the threes. Um, so it, it acquitted itself quite nicely. It's it's not a car you look at and think, wow, that's a slalom machine, but it, it actually does okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so the event was fun. I mean, I think with some practice, I could start to turn in some decent times. What we need to do is they get that Montron Blanc thing happening there, and Sasha Annis comes down. He needs yeah. to get in the seat. He'll show you a few things. I'm looking forward oh. to sitting with him. Yeah, no kidding. Well, that's, that's exactly what this car was built for. As a matter of fact, uh, in another little bit more than two weeks i'm going to take it back to that track to icar but i'm doing a full-time attack on the big track that will be interesting this is where this thing can sink its teeth in and run. cool yep sounds like fun well, yeah. thanks for the report ian no problem and i will get the videos off to you um, i got some videos so hopefully we'll be able to edit okay. something together so if anyone keep your eyes open we'll uh, we'll probably get that out sometime in the next week cool all right well let's get into the news here well uh one of the big things there kind of happened of course and there's a lot of discussions about it but i don't know why people are making such a big deal about it but anyways so the model 3 in the u.s has increased by 400 dollars. so it used to be uh let me see here why why is my estimator here going up oh i know it's because i have i'm just gonna bring up the uh, tesla website here so you can follow along yeah thirty nine thousand nine hundred dollars used to be thirty nine thousand five hundred dollars so uh literally what is that a two percent increase one percent increase something like that not a big deal at the end of the day of course, a lot of people are like, what happened to the $35,000 car? Well, you can still order it off menu, um, unlike the, the one here in Canada. Also up by 400. What's that? Even that's also $400 more. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, what do we think this is? Trade tariffs coming in? Possibly? I have no idea. Just I really, cost increases? I know, I know the, um, the U.S. government uh, today uh, said that they could be willing to delay any decision on tariffs for up to six months. Um, so I don't know if it's just more of balance in the books. Uh, they're saying maybe they need to raise more revenue. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, $400 is not a lot uh, for an individual sale, but collectively it adds up. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have really no earthly idea why it would be that much. It's important to remember that price increases happens across cars all the time. Yeah. It's just Tesla just gets so many eyeballs on it. It's just like, oh, the world's falling apart. It went up 400 bucks. I don't know. Whatever. We're just reporting the news. We don't make it, right? <laughs> oh. no, exactly. And the thing is, you're right, Trevor. They do adjust. It's just that MM, the, 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 the typical OEMs don't change the MSRP. They usually have that set for the year. But what they're doing is constantly messing around in the background with the dealer costs and the incentives. Yeah, and the rebates and stuff. Yeah. yeah, so that's just a different way of doing it. It's just, well, the MSRP stayed the same. Yep, yeah, right, but... No one's paying the same price for the car, and it's constantly being adjusted in the background, regionally, mm -hmm. whatever else. So I guess Tesla has to be upfront about it because it's one price fits all, right? I mean, it's that's what it is. What it is. Exactly. Okay. Well, there's your answer. Four hundred bucks at the end of the day. It's not the end of the world, but it is what it is. So, speaking of which, that brings us to the second one here because um, we wanted to talk about a slight confusion, and Ian and I were talking about this before the show began because we've had some Canadian people reach out to us and say. There's some confusion with the loan estimator on the Canadian side compared to the U.S. So if I look at the U.S. side here, and I'll just bring up the uh, Tesla page. Whoop. Okay, estimate payment. If I go in here and I go under loan, I can put a down payment. Say I want 5000 bucks, whatever, 72 months. I can put zero down if I want, okay? Now the confusion comes if I go to the Canadian side here. Let's just go over here. And uh, if I go down to estimate payment and I go to loan, there is a default down payment of $7,500. And if I try to change it, it says, no, $7,500 minimum. Can't do so, it. Nope, can't do it. So uh, Ian and I have discovered that we think it's a bug. So uh, for those of you who are wondering why the estimator seems to be off, we think it's a bug. So we're going to, I'm going to send an email to Tesla Corporate. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get it um, pushed up the ranks, maybe then get that fixed or whatever. Um, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go by that and I wouldn't take that as gospel. I think you can put basically whatever you want down. So, um, oh, I, we think it's probably broken. And I can confirm that. I had a friend of mine go down uh, to the store last night to place an order and they, they, yeah, it's like, whatever honest, you, 
what yeah. is it, 3200 bucks, whatever? Yeah, the, the $3,200 in his case, uh, for, for an SR Plus, they were perfectly okay with the $3,200 to confirm the order. You know, the deposit for the order was more than enough, and they would finance the, the, the entire remaining balance. Yeah, so there's no problem there. But yeah, he was very freaked out looking online. He says, oh my God, I got to give him 3200 for the deposit plus another 75 <laughs> so like, no, mm-hmm. not the case. You can, you know, at least on an SR Plus in Canada, if your credit rating is anywhere near normal, the $3,200 deposit is more than enough to secure the car and get the rest financed. Okay, well, there you go. There's your answer. So we think it's a bug. We'll uh, we'll get it escalated and maybe we'll get that fixed for uh, for everybody. Thanks for sending that in, whoever did. All right, uh, next piece of, uh, next article <clears throat> comes uh, courtesy of Bloomberg. And uh, I think this is a case of maybe Panasonic talking out of line here, but they're basically saying that, um, someone at Panasonic was saying that uh, uh, they, they forecast a drop in earnings and sales. Basically, they're stating that uh, Tesla will run out of, ba- uh, batteries will run out if Tesla starts selling the Model Y and expands its business next year, he told reporters. Uh, reporters. What do we do then? It's one of the few topics to discuss with Tesla, including battery production in China. I think, like I said, Panasonic, this is not the first time Panasonic has kind of spoken out of turn when it comes to Tesla. I'm sure Tesla sometimes doesn't really like Panasonic talking too much to the press, um, just the way they seem to be. Again, um, battery production is one of the things that has to be ramped and scaled appropriately. Uh, We saw that there was if you look at the Powerwall situation and the power pack situation last year, severely uh, curtailed, basically because they were trying to ramp up Model 3. Now that Model 3 is ramped up, now they can start ramping up a little bit on the power pack stuff. I did mention, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast last week, but I was at a Tesla meeting and there is a Tesla power pack, you know, the industrial scale mm-hmm. um, installations close by my house. And I've yet to get out there and go and find it. But apparently it's four megawatts, so it's a fair size. Anyways, it's local. It's part of my local utility. So, um, yeah, I think what's going on here is that they're just kind of talking and saying, yeah, well, we have to talk about Tesla. And uh, as far as the investments are concerned, um, I'm a little, not perturbed, but the fact that we still haven't seen any dirt being moved over in Nevada um, in preparation uh, for the Model Y production Either one of two things is happening. Either they're reusing the internal space right now because we don't know how much actually internal space is actually left at the Gigafactory for for production expansion. So either they're using existing space and just moving things around or they still have to expand the factory. I'm still of of the belief that they have to expand the factory to do more battery production and car production, but we haven't seen any expansion of the factory down there. It's still the L shape. Uh, still only about, what is it, 33% finished or something like that. And they, you know, they've said by 2020 it's supposed to be finished. And, you know, got another year here. So um, they did do that capital raise. So now they got some money. So uh, maybe we'll see some dirt moving. I don't know. What do you guys, you guys think that that's going to happen anytime soon? It should. It could be, it could be a matter of permits that they're going through. Cause I know, uh, sometimes certain localities can take longer to get permits than others. And depends well, what they're not really, they were able to get permits for the gigafactory really fast. Oh no. I mean, I understand they can. I, I just wonder if there's something in the plans we haven't seen yet. And so there could be some other permits involved or some other contracts we're trying to iron out. Um, I mean, they're definitely very busy in China getting gigafactory three up and running, <laughs> uh, very quickly. Um, the one thing I will say just sort of a, as a tie into this, I think it's, I think it's a good thing to hear Panasonic say this in the sense that it's an indication that there is a lot of versatility in using batteries for different installations. Uh, there's even reports now that Panasonic had about the solar panel production, that a lot of the production uh, that's being made now is actually not being used for Tesla. It's being used for third-party products. Um, again, that's that's part of the rant I'll get into later on, but I think it's, it's <laughs> good that there is this um, this great need for these two um, energy solutions and that um, if they're forecasting a shortage, it could be because they're forecasting great demand. So if the, if the idea that there's going to be a great demand yields a greater production, then so be it. So mm-hmm. they could be putting the cart before the horse here, but, uh, but I see it as more of a positive uh, down the line. I know. Th- oh, go ahead, Ian. Well, I was just going to jump in. We were actually talking about this um, at the, uh, at the event on the weekend and 
I think it makes a lot more sense the more I think about it. And Pierre agreed with me that uh, they should really be building the Y in the three concurrently on the same lines or at least in the same facility because of the commonality of the chassis mm -hmm. and all the parts. So in a perfect world, Fremont should be building those two models. And then maybe the Gigafactory would do the rest of them. And I, I think the only inhibitor to that is there's a lot of really heavy equipment needed to make the S and the X, especially if there's like three gazillion ton press that does uh, some of the body parts for the S. Um, the one that sets off earthquake meters there <laughs> pretty much all the time. You know the one I'm talking about. Yes. Here, yeah, the factories yeah. were there. But uh, that, that would probably be pretty expensive to relocate all that machinery. But if you think about it, doing the three and, and, and the Y in the same building, that's the way to go. Um, well, didn't they didn't they mention that they were going to possibly um, curtail their plans for building at the Gigafactory and maybe build some more tents? Yeah, well, on the that, west side, right? Like so. We as of what was it? Just a few weeks ago, we were talking about this. They said mm -hmm. uh, on uh, was it on the financial call or was it during the? Uh, I, I'm going to think that's yeah. It was a financial call. The was that the financial call? call? Yeah, the earnings call or the um, or the full self driving. Um, the investor day on, mm -hmm. on FSD, but they said, yeah, we're not, we're still looking at both, both locations and everybody's ears perked up like, what? Like it was a given until then that it was going to be Gigafactory. So I don't know. I, hmm. I think all bets are off until they actually sort that out. Well, we'll <laughs> know when they decide. Yeah. I mean, right now it's just speculation, right? So, but, uh, well, they did say that they've ordered the tooling. So, yeah. You know. They're, they're yeah. going to be spending some money on the tooling, so yeah. uh, at some point it's going to start arriving, and they got to yeah. they got to make a decision where they're going to put where it. Where do you send the truck? Yeah, <laughs> back it up, boys. Yeah, that's it. Please change ship to address too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Speaking of Model Y, the Model Y was spotted in the wild. Um, Charge Point did this tweet here. Why don't you tell us what you think about this Tesla? And of course, everybody on the internet was like, that's an ugly picture. It looks like crap, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we've said this many times before. Lenses do funny things to pictures. And second of all, people said the same thing about the Model 3 until you actually saw it in person. So please, don't <laughs> pass judgment on the Model Y until you see it in person. Ian and don't I were very fortunate. Right? <laughs> What's that, Eric? Uh, so don't judge a book by its cover. Exactly. So yes, please uh, please reserve judgment until you see the car. It is gorgeous in person. I think it's going to do exceptionally well. Yeah, so. for sure. It, it, the thing definitely works in, in person. I, yeah. I didn't see a bad angle on it uh, when, when I was there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. No, it look, it's, it's nice. Um, next little bit here. Uh, it, this is a real short article here, but... Um, Today is the last day, um, and the offer expires at 11.59 p.m. Uh, Tesla is announcing their offer is consideration for previously announced offer to purchase Exchange Maxwell Technologies for common stock. Um, they do say that unless it's further extended or earlier terminated in accordance with the merger agreement between Tesla and Maxwell. So it's still on the books, but they got to lease until tonight to finalize that. Otherwise, there's nothing precluding them um, of extending the uh the offer on that i know there's been a lot of talk about maxwell and i've actually done some research on these guys as, as far as what they're doing with their uh with their dry lithium um application process i think uh, sean mitchell did a, an excellent video on that too this has a uh, very promising technology and i hope it passes because i'm gonna say it uh compared to solar city this seems like a better investment long term <laughs> Um, fortunately, the Solar City thing uh, still—it's—it's uh, it's, it's like the ugly duckling at this point. It's not getting any love. Um, again, them buying Maxwell doesn't mean that improvements are going to happen immediately. These things take time; they have to retrofit. It's a different process. Maybe we'll have something uh, more to say about this technology in a future podcast, whatever. But it, it's very promising as far as lowering costs, reducing um, volatile compounds that they have to use. Um, and it will uh, ultimately also lead to improved uh, uh, battery longevity as well. But that's that's a topic for another day. Uh, let's see here. There's a new... If, if you haven't seen the Model X lately on the Tesla design site, let me bring it up here. Uh, but they have a new wheel design. Well, I'm going to go to custom order a Model X here. I already have one, but hey, what the heck. All right, so we'll pick a standard range, go to the next car. And look, they have a new two-tone wheel design. Unfortunately, I can't zoom in. Well, the wheel design is not new. The finish is new. Yeah, the finish. It, yeah, the finish is different. So it's still the um, what do they call this? The, the slipstream. The slipstream wheel. Yes, I used to have these. I sold them. I got the twenty twos now. So, anyways, they they put a um, uh, like a carbon finish around the edges and stuff. 
So yeah, what they, did, they essentially painted between the spokes, and what it does is it gives it the illusion of being a much bigger wheel. Because the problem with the slipstream is it's got that rather large lip insert. That that's does true. Correct. Yes, compared to my turbine, because I have the twenty-two inch turbines, and yeah. it's night and day difference. The look between the two. The, the, uh, yeah, between the two it's, it's, it's a 20 inch wheel, but it looks like an 18 because it's got this big, thick lip that sort of reduces the, the look of the diameter. So when you see the image, like just go back and forth between the silver and yeah. that two tone one, and the two tone one looks two inches bigger because that it tricks your eye into thinking. Yeah, that. look at that. Yeah, you're right. Look at that. Yeah, no, we, we goof around with stuff like that all the time to give the wheel a bigger look. And in this case, it really works on it. It's it's cool. I, that was a good idea. Yeah, let, me, let me put it in the best color, white. And there's a foot between the two. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> Was there ever any doubt? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I agree. That looks better. I would I would totally do that. Um, except they want $2,600 for the freaking paint. Of course they do. Oh, Tesla. Because margin. <laughs> Margins. I don't Anything know, man. The price of the Model 3 down, I'm all for it. Make those people pay more. Oh, well, what do you do? What do you do? All right. Um, got another article here. This one comes courtesy of our friends at Tesla Roddy. Literally breaking news today. Tesla is rolling out an improved SNX battery thermal management software update um, amidst some of the uh, fires that have been happening in Hong Kong. Now, they, they made a statement here. They said that we currently have well over half a million vehicles on the road, which is more than double the number that we had at the beginning of last year. And Tesla's team, a battery expert, uses the data to thoroughly investigate incidents that occur and understand the root cause. Although the fire incidents involving Tesla vehicles are already extremely rare and our cars are 10 times less likely to experience a gas fire than a gas car. Thank you, Tesla, for putting in there. They like to repeat that. Uh, we believe the right number of incidents to aspire to is zero, which is the correct way of approaching it. Uh, they don't really give us any details as to what they're changing. I'm sure that uh, hackers or people that are smarter than us may end, uh, end up discovering the changes over time once they've been able to calculate the differences but it's nice to see that they're being proactive about that i know there was some discussion on uh, on the internet uh when these fires happen as to whether tesla investigates them and uh, but they, they i can assure you they certainly do they take this stuff very seriously um so nice to see that they're being proactive about it again we're still waiting what is it 29.16 2019.16 is still Still being deployed. I haven't seen any updates on my car lately. I'm still stuck on 8.5. I don't know what the hell's going on. Oh, really? Yeah, Ooh, you need to call about that. Off at head office. I don't understand. <laughs> you need to call about that. Yeah. Yeah, making us make an appointment with service. Well, see if I they can push it. Well, speaking of which, I, I'm trying a new trick, by the way, and and uh, Jay Pace is, is going to love this one because oh. we're all waiting for our carbon spoilers, right, on the P3Ds. Yes. So I, I somebody, I'm. And I'm gonna. Somebody had tried this and said, "Here's how you do it. Basically, go and do the online service appointment thing, and just put it down as an appointment." So I did. I went and booked an appointment online. I said, "Please install spoiler," and like literally five minutes later, I get a confirmation of the time. And then five minutes after that, I get a note from them saying, uh, "Oh, we think your uh, request would be better served by the mobile service. So we're canceling your, you know, appointment at the store, and the mobile people will reach out to you. Hmm. They have to reach out to me." But that was, you know, 24 hours ago. So we'll see what happens. Um, our good friend Mark Benton was suggesting on Twitter that um, the spoilers basically arrive. And when you make it a request, then they will match you up with a spoiler. So there seems to be some confusion as to yeah, when my, it actually my, happens. Whether you have to, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. anyways, if you're waiting for the spoilers, um, yeah, give Tesla a call, service, in a, you know, schedule an appointment, whatever, and, and see what happens. I'm surprised that even after all this time, they still don't have all the spoilers ready. Oh, I like really. <laughs> it's just like, oh well, I'll 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 let you know what happens. <laughs> well, at least you got your brake pedals, right? Well, they came with the car, yeah. Yeah, I know, but I'm just I'm, I'm being I'm being facetious. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care about the badge because I'm going to leave it badgeless. I, I like the stealth factor. I, I agree with you. I, I'm not keen on the badge thing. I'm not keen on the badge thing. All right, next one here. There's a really uh, great video. Erica <clears throat> suggested this one here. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll, we'll put a link. Uh, by the way, again, all the links to everything we talk about will be in the podcast description or the video description. Anyways, uh, C, um, CGP Gray. Yep. Um, Eric, why don't you tell us about this fella here? Because uh, Sure. So I've been following CGP Gray's uh, video content for quite a while. He's a professor. He's a great YouTuber, podcaster, does a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, and he put a video that he had of a trip when he was out in California and did sort of like a loop trip uh, that I think took like, I don't know, 
number of days uh, going back and forth in the west half of the U.S. And um, he had never driven a Tesla before. So he <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. It's informative. It's great. But for someone who's never driven an electric car before, specifically a Tesla, um, it's like a kid in a candy store watching this video. So he starts with like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And it just pans out to his uh, Blue Model X uh, that he had for a period of time. So he, I think he had the car for about a week. Yeah. Um, drove it around. It's 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 a it's almost an hour. The video's like fifty some odd minutes. If you get a chance, watch it. You can skip through it. Uh, he's got a bunch of links on his YouTube description for that video, where you can sort of see the dash cam uh, version of the trip. Uh, he even has one that's like a twelve times speed, so you can sort of, and that's already over a three hour video. Yeah. Um, but now you can see how he's driving it, how it handles autopilot. He talks about charging the car. Um, on uh, level one, level two, using superchargers. So it's it's just great to see someone who's um, a well-informed person having the experience for the very first time, that epiphany of like how great this is. Um, <laughs> and it's just it's just fun to see uh, videos like this on the pop up on the web. I, I really like the video. I very much enjoyed it, especially his part where he gets to the loneliest road in America because he decides yeah. to change his route and kind of veer off of the supercharger. So he ended up going to campgrounds and hotels to charge. And uh, he discovered that, yeah, you can do this. So you have to be a little bit more patient, but anyways, yeah. highly recommended you watch the video. It's quite funny. Um, I really enjoyed it, but yeah, his, he, he, he comes back at the end of the thing. He comes back and he's just like, he, he doesn't want to turn in the car. He loves it so much. And yeah. uh, I understand that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, great video. Highly recommend it. Um, yeah. I'll, again, I'll put a link down in the video description, and you guys can watch that. All right. The next uh, little bit here we're going to talk about is, and it's still popping up, and I know that, Ian, you had some questions about this too, so let's get into it. We're going to talk about paint correction, paint protection film, and ceramic coating. What the heck are these things? We're still getting people. Now, I will say this. If you had this done and you're already familiar with it, tune out. Come back later. I don't want to bore you to death. But we're still getting questions about this. People are confused uh, as to what the th three things are. So once again, what is paint correction? What is paint protection film? And what is ceramic coating? Now, just so you know, I've had all three things done to my car. I, I, I got it done a month after I got my car. I should have did it right at the start. But delivery times and vacation times and Christmas just kind of got in the way. Um, the three things are independent of one another. However, they are related to each other. So let me first begin with, oh, by the way, <laughs> again, I'll put a link in the video description because I did a video with my friend Fabian, um, who does, here, I'll bring up the, the page here so you can see what we're talking about. I'll put a link to this video. I did two videos with Fabian. One of them was when I went in and he actually educated he wanted to do a video on educating people on what these processes are, what they are. And then we did a separate video of the actual process on my car. So there, two of them are linked back to back and I'll put them in the video description so you can understand what's going on. So first things first, paint correction is essentially the process of fixing flaws in the paint or the clear coat. And I have to be clear about this. It's usually the clear coat because if you look at the way a modern car is actually painted, um, first, you take the body in white, right? So when the car is actually manufactured, it's just bare metal. Um, before you even paint, and I know all about painting because I've built two airplanes, aluminum, and I learned a lot about painting. Paint does not stick to metal very well. You have to do a lot of prep work. So in the case of these bodies, they first go through essentially a, a process of degreasing um, because... Aluminum, for example, comes from the factory with a, a very thin mic microscopic layer of protection on, on the actual metal itself to prevent it from corroding. Aluminum doesn't rust, but it does corrode if it it's oxidizes. exposed to air, right? It oxidizes. So in order to paint the aluminum, you have to degrease it, then you have to etch it, then you have to prime it, then you have to paint it. That's essentially, in a nutshell... Uh, the processes. Steel is exactly the same way, except that it has grease and oils and fingerprints and stuff. So they have to degrease the bodies. Um, unlike the old days, um, cars are generally not painted by hand. There are certain little areas that are done by hand. They're largely done by robots. So the degreasing and the priming process of the cars, unfortunately, I don't have videos to show you here, is essentially in modern cars now, the whole car is actually dipped in a whole 
swimming pool of this stuff, if you will. So the whole body literally gets completely submerged in the degreasing agent. Um, and then usually with aluminum, it goes through a secondary process where it's etched. Uh, you have to put some tooth into the metal so that the primer sticks. Uh, the primer process, which is the second process, again, the whole body is dipped in primer. So it actually infiltrates the whole body inside and out, uh, wherever it can get in. Um, so if you think that your body on your car is bare metal uh, underneath the carpet, it is not. It's actually primed. Um, if you look at a lot of, and I won't name manufacturers, <coughs> GM and Ford, um, if, <laughs> if you see some older cars driving around and the paint is peeling off and all you see is primer underneath, um, that's a bad paint process, and there's several environmental factors or paint or chemistry factors that will make the paint lift off the primer. But very rarely will you see bare metal. Primer sticks very well as long as it's prepped properly. So once you have a primer on there, then it goes through the actual paint process where the multi-coat red or the pearl white or how many coats are needed to get the finish that you need on the car. And then finally... Um, you have a clear coat. Now, clear coats really only came in into vogue, I think, what, about the mid-80s, right, Ian? Mm, Maybe yeah, a little sooner than that? 70s, 80s, yeah. I don't think it was early 70s. I think they were still Not doing early, enamel no, paints for the most part. late when they became common. It would be something of a deluxe thing, you know, on some of the luxury cars, and then it yeah. became commonplace. But, but now it's commonplace. Sure. Right? Every Everything. car has a clear coat on it. Yeah. So the clear coat is actually what you touch. You don't actually touch the paint. It's a protectant for the actual enamel paint that's underneath. So getting back to my process here, <laughs> sorry about that, but I like to educate people as, as to how things come about. When you go for a paint correction, and if you're considering to do um, paint protection film, PPF, or ceramic coating, or combination of the both, you should if your car has never had it done before, or even if it's new from the factory, it should have a paint correction done. Now, the paint correction is a physically labor-intensive process where a detailer will apply different rubbing and buffing compounds to level the clear coat. It's not the paint. It's the clear coat. Now, you have to remember all paints um, from factories these days, unless they're actually applied by hand and color sanded, have uh, orange peel. Um, orange peel is partly a chemical process, it's partly the, the way the paint's applied and stuff, but if, if you look at it uh, on an angle, you can't see it straight on, but if you look at cars on an angle, you always see these little, well, it looks like orange peel. Waves. Um, yeah, little waves. And the only way to remove that is to do a color sanding. Well, you can't do a color sanding on production, on high volume production cars, it just doesn't happen, right? Um, you can do that on a custom car or you have it custom painted and you want to spend the money to do that. So the, the process of paint correction is try and get the clear coat as level as possible and then take out the swirls because even as careful as you are as a person, you will get dirt and grime underneath, your, <clears throat> excuse me, under your wash mitt and you will introduce swirls. Um, look at any black car. It's pretty obvious. Any dark colored car. It's, it's less obvious if you have a lighter colored car, but uh, trust me, the, you will get swirls on there. Anyway, so the process of that is try to buff those out as, 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 as much as possible before you apply either one of the other two finishes. Because paint protection film, for example, and depending on the brand, um, the brand that I have on my car is called uh, NanoGuard. It's by, it's, well, it's by Prestige Films. It's called ClearGuard Nano SR, if I remember correctly. And uh, Fabian, uh, my detailer, recommended this particular brand compared to most of the others. Xpel is a popular one, of course, because they have a lot of marketing and people know about it. Is um, Xpel, for example, for whatever reason, the process that it's manufactured and stuff, when you apply it on a car that has orange peel, it also has its own little orange peel. So it actually makes it a little worse. Um, the Clear Guard, the prestige film that I have on mine, has none of that. When you put it on, it looks like glass. Um, but it's not as popular. It's popular in California, where I think it comes from. But outside of there, it doesn't have as much uh, exposure and stuff. So if you're looking at something, um, a paint protection film or something like that, um, I do recommend you look at that because I actually saw the difference. Because Fabian, if you look at the video, he actually applies it on a black sample that he has. He puts the XPEL on one side and he puts the clear guard nano and you can actually see it and I show it on the camera you mm -hmm. can still see the orange peel it makes its own anyways that's a discussion for another day so the bottom line here paint protection film is a physical barrier it's a thin clear bra if you will that gets applied to the paint now some people will apply it just to the nose of the car um, some people will apply it to the whole car or anywhere in between 
Um, sometimes they'll put it on the rocker panels and stuff. And the whole purpose of paint protection film is to act as a physical barrier to prevent rock chips and little stones and sand and stuff from wrecking your paint. Trust me, um, I already have a couple nicks in my um, in the front of my car, and uh, the paint protection film has taken the brunt of it. So if you value your paint, um, I recommend that you get a physical barrier on there, and that's what paint protection film does for you. Um, now, and if, I, if I may interject here, the one you have does have, I believe it's in the video, self-healing properties. Most well. of them do. Yeah. Yes. Um, for example, uh, because it's a plastic film on there and because of the way that they're manufactured, if you get a little scratch, now I'm not talking about a deep gouge. I'm talking just average. You can run a key across it or something like that. Not, not deep keying. I'm just saying just mm -hmm. drag your keys or something like that. If you leave it out in the sun or you apply a heat gun to it, it the molecules just kind of blend in together and they just kind of self-heal. So it acts as a protection. And, you know, like I said, it's not a it, it's not a magic bullet for everything, but it does provide physical barrier from from it touching. The, the nice thing about it is that let's say in five years um, it gets dinged or damaged or whatever the case may be. You can peel it off and your paint underneath is still pristine. It's still like new. OK, so that's that's the whole purpose of that. And I think it's only good for about, what, five years or so? Um, it, it, every manufacturer has different warranties. I think in mm -hmm. my case, uh, I expect to get about five years out of it. At that point, okay. now you peel it off, you put a new one on. Um, on my car, I had the whole front of the car done. I had the hood done. I had the mirrors done and the headlights and half of the fenders. Some people will go and do the whole car. Mm -hmm. That's more expensive. You're several thousand dollars at that point. Um it is something that I will consider doing for the Roadster because it's going to be super expensive to <laughs> protect that car. So that's a talk for another day. But on my car, um, having gone through many cars in the past, and I plan on keeping this one for a long time, I felt that it was money uh, well spent on that. So, oh, by the way, most paint protection films also have a modicum of hydro hydrophobicity, which is uh, repelling water. Not all of them do, which is why most people will also apply a ceramic coating on top of the paint protection film. Now, you can do a ceramic coating separate from the PPF. But if you're going to do PPF and ceramic, you put the PPF on first, and then the ceramic. You can't do the other way because when you put the ceramic coating on there, and a the ceramic coating is another silicate layer that goes on top of your clear coat. So think of it like a clear coat for your clear coat. And it has hydrophobic properties. So what that means is that when you spray it with water, the water just basically just beads right off of it. It makes washing a car. So, you like that, Eric? Okay, well, there's some that sound effects great. for you. <laughs> when you wash your car with ceramic coating, it's like a permanent wax. Think of it like that. Um, Fabian has a great way of, uh, of talking about wax. He says, you know, take a candle, roll it down the street. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> going to collect everything it touches. Exactly. That's why we don't. I don't recommend you do waxes. Um, it's labor intensive. It's not. It's not much better than about six months, and it's pretty old school. We have modern nanotechnologies now that can apply essentially a permanent wax to your car. Now, in my case, I have three coats of uh, Fine Lab. Thank you, Fine Lab. You're a good sponsor. Um, Fabian applied it, recommended it, and I have a five-year warranty on it. Now, I do have to go for a yearly. Uh, what do they call it? A uh, like a touch up, tune up. A uh, <laughs> now the word escapes me. A um, oh gosh, a, a, a tune up, a wash. They do a wash and they double check it, make sure it's still working and stuff. That's part of the warranty process. Anyways, so in my case, I have three coats on there, so it gives me a five year warranty on that. Um, like I said. The whole purpose of a ceramic coating is not a physical barrier against stone chips. You will still get stone chips on there, okay? So don't think that that's all you need on your car. If you're worried about stone chips, you need PPF. If you want to make your car easy to wash, you do ceramic coating, period. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And now, if, you, if you've had your car for a period of time and you have minor paint defects uh, from having been outside, you're driving, whatever it is, um, would you recommend doing, say, the first process of sort of getting the um, the paint defects sort of handled and then having either PPF or ceramic put on it? Or yes. can you just put ceramic on the paint as it is and it'll just look better? No, no, I wouldn't do that. You, I really highly recommend you do a paint correction before you do any of the others because if your paint is not perfect, all you're doing is you're sealing in those defects and it's not going to make your paint look any better. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can take a 10 year old black car that's never been treated really well and you can put ceramic on it and it'll be easy to wash but it's still gonna look like crap so you know if you can get it uh, ideally what you should be doing if you want to do any of these processes is as soon as you get the car take it in get it done mm-hmm. you can do it after the fact but it just makes the process of paint correction much more labor intensive later on because you've introduced a lot of contaminants and stuff into the paint mm-hmm. now all that stuff has to be removed um i know this well because i had about five of the guys that do this see my car at the show and of course i was like great <laughs> quote time so i was shopping mm-hmm. coding the entire time i was there because there's all kinds of people to show doing this yeah. and they're looking at the top of the car saying oh yeah it looks great i said well have a look at the rocker panels and they they, yeah. they sort of looked in horror it's like what did you do the parry deck car with this i said i had these nine inch wide plus 30 wheels all winter blasting my rocker panels what do you yes, think yes and we put a lot of sand on the roads here in the winter ah uh, so yeah that's yeah. going to need um it's fair share of correction before yeah the rocker panels take the brunt of it uh they're they're particularly bad especially if you have a dark car i mean we've i've seen plenty of pictures from people saying uh, you know i've had all kinds of problems with my paint in the rocker panel areas look it's it's just the nature of the thing so uh, that those are areas you can actually put paint protection film you don't have to do the whole car you can actually do the rocker panels the little bit of the dog leg that comes up over the rear arch on the car you can do that that's that's fine i'm going to do the nose and the rockers Exactly. So again, it's one of those things that if you can budget for it, please do it as soon as you get the car or or very shortly thereafter, because the last thing you want to do is go through a season or winter season, whatever, and get all these problems because after the fact that, I mean, it's very, very difficult to correct for that stuff. And it's extremely, extremely labor intensive. If Fabian spent about 16 hours buffing and, and taking all of watch the video, you'll understand. He found all kinds of little flaws and stuff. Yeah, I have to remember, all cars have paint flaws in the paint. They're mass-produced cars. They're not done by hand. They're inspected. They have certain limitations and what passes and whatnot, uh, but they do have problems. On my car, I had little areas where you could actually see through the paint where um, the workers at the factory had sanded some of the aluminum before it was painted. That stuff actually shows through sometimes. You have to look really careful at it, and detailers are anal about this stuff. I wouldn't see it, but they do. I had a little dust nib, um, which is a little pinprick in the in the clear coat on my passenger side door, and it's still there. Fabian was able to level it down as much as he could, but you can't remove that without repainting the door. Um, I know where it is. It doesn't bother me, whatever. Um, so getting back, uh, oh, by the way, Michael Bodner, for example, he just took a 400-mile road trip. If you've seen his pictures on, on Twitter, uh, it's, what is, Eric, Eric, is it like bug season in Florida right now? What's going on? Uh, love bugs are, are is that what you call them love bugs love bugs they're called love bugs and essentially they're bugs that they fly in pairs very often so do they have the long the long wings and the long tails yeah uh we call and those mayflies here and they're solid black and they well there's a little bit of red in them but the thing okay. is when you're for whatever reason if you're on the turnpike going towards orlando and if you i know we have our, our friend nate who lives in central florida yes. michael just recently with the family to central florida you cannot drive any length of the turnpike north of say martin county which is north of west palm beach um you can't go through the turnpike in those areas and not just be smothered windshield front of your car everything and to you have like especially with the south florida sun being what it is if you don't wash your car oh. soon enough it just cakes that crap on there. Oh. So when you do have to like you soap and water and try to get it, you're just rubbing and rubbing and yeah. rubbing and rubbing. Guess they're, what that does to your uh, clear coat if you mm, don't use the right products? Ruins it. Yep, exactly. Also, I was, I was going to say before when you mentioned about all these different processes, uh, or as you say, the processes, is uh, in your video, he talks about the kind of soap you should use because even the kind of soap can make a difference once you have these protections on. Um, how you want to have a pH balance close to neutral around seven yeah. uh, to minimize the uh, the chance of you ruining the uh, the clear coat or anything else. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a whole science behind it. These guys, I mean, that's they're pros. That's what they do. And yeah. the reason the paint correction, the PPF, the ceramic coatings, especially the paint correction, the reason it's expensive is that it's extremely labor intensive. Michael can attest to this because he just cleaned his car. And getting those bugs off the car, I mean, even myself, we don't have as quite as many bugs and stuff, but even, even with the ceramic coating on my car, thank God I have it, mm-hmm. um, I still have to rub. Um, 
you know, I don't rub as hard as I used to if I didn't have it and stuff. But, I mean, the bugs do stick. The, the trick with these things, and even Fabian mentioned it too, is that if you get bird droppings or bugs or anything like that, that stuff is acidic. It's not good for your clear coat. It's not good for your paint. It's not good for any of the things, even the protectants you put on there. you got to get that stuff off as soon as possible because it's not good. Anyways, don't mean to turn this into a rant and stuff. I just wanted to explain a little bit what the processes are. So paint correction is the process of getting the paint ready and clear and clean before you do in the others. The PPF is a barrier, a physical barrier for rock chips. Think of it like that. And the ceramic coating essentially is like a permanent wax. It makes your car easier to clean. And you can do all three or you can do them individually. I recommend all three if you can. But the, the basics of PPF or ceramic is do you want rock chip protection or do you want clear uh, or you want an easier car to wash? Or, or if you want both, you need both. But one is not going to give you the benefits of both. You need a combination of two or one or the other. So I hope that explains exactly what the process is. If you have more, please watch the video. <laughs> we go into great detail as to what that's all about. But it, it, it's all the rage right now. Everybody's talking about this stuff because we have modern technologies and ways of protecting the paints now. I mean, let's face it. These are not cheap cars. People want to keep them looking as best as, as they can. Um, you know, if you get a ding in your door, man, you know, we have paintless dent removal now. God, that stuff is magic now. For a couple hundred bucks now, you can get dents taken out of your car without going to the body shop and having the you know drilling holes and pulling the dents out i mean we're talking minor dents i've seen some pretty big rough stuff though too but uh, the days of having to repaint and stuff um you know most of these guys are pros they can take that stuff out so modern technology we have we live in some great times now so fine lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your tesla's paint leather carpet plastic and wheels effectively blocking all those uv rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. All right, we're, we're almost to the point where we can start talking about some of the viewer questions, but I do want to bring something up. Ian, there were some discussions because I did send out a tweet to Elon because there were some reports of people with their windows rolling down. Now, we think it's a bug or it could be a software thing, but when you get caught in the rain, the water intrusion inside the car. So I, I asked Elon to see if it was possible to have some kind of remote ability in the app to roll the windows up or down. However, you found something on the NHTSA site, didn't you? Yeah, we um, this has been discussed, you know, over, um, over on the forum and Twitter, whatever, the last couple of months. And I decided to look a little further into it. So if you look at uh, NHTSA, site, yeah, NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they're basically the regulators for the U.S. And 95% of the motor vehicle laws in Canada, from Transport Canada, sort of follow what NHTSA does. So for, for both Canada and the U.S., a lot of the same regulations apply. So there's something called FMVSS 118. And that's the regulation that covers um, power windows, sunroof, and a few other obscure things. And what that regulation, that, that's been modified a few times over the years. The latest version of it was dated for, I think, around uh, 2011. And they updated it to say that you cannot have uh, any remote activation of the windows um, that is not line of sight more than six meters away from the car. So in other words, you can do it with a remote control as long as you're within six meters of the vehicle. Actually, so, I think I found the paragraph G. It says 11 yeah. meters. Uh, oh, no, I don't think that's what it should be. Uh, I'm reading here section G. I think this is it. It says, upon continuous activation of a remote actuation device, provided that the remote actuation device um, shall be incapable of closing the power window partition to roof panel if the device and the vehicle are separated by an opaque surface and provided that the remote actuation device shall be incapable of closing the power window partition or roof panel from a distance of more than 11 meters from, 11 meters from the vehicle. Is that the section? Oh, that's interesting because I was directly on NHTSA's site and the copy that I have it says 6 meters. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. I'll have to go back and look. And people think on the internet that designing cars is easy. Oh, God. No, go go and read the whole thing. I mean, uh, we have a link to it here, uh, Trev. You should publish it later. The I entire, will. yeah, the entire uh, NHTSA site for like all the regulations. It's like thousands of pages. But yeah, bottom line is they're saying that you can't have this, like you're never going to be able to do this with your phone, you know, 
from an infinite distance away. I think the basic idea is they want you know, the, the operator to be within sight of the vehicle so that you make sure that there's no animals or children poking their heads out. Well, that makes out. sense. Yeah, I, that's, that's the general gist of it because um, there was a voluntary um, – there's a voluntary sort of agreement on this, and I think in Europe they started in 2009, and then NHTSA adopted it for their regulation in 2011 in North America. Um, because prior to that, you you could do it. Like a lot of vehicles have that remote activation with the uh, with the key fob. Even I had it on my Audi. I was like, why did yeah, all that stuff disappear? Too. Yeah. And so why did this stuff start to disappear? And uh, I think the manufacturers took it a step further. I think there's just a lot of people scared about any legal ramifications if there's an injury because of this. I mean, there's obviously sensors in the motor, so if, if it gets jammed, uh, you know, it'll automatically retract, kind of like your yeah, garage pin, door yeah, will. The pinch, yeah, the pinch feature. Yeah. Exactly. But you can still do a lot of harm. Like, you know, if you had a child's neck in there, I certainly wouldn't want to test, you know, the, mm. the, the tensioning feature, feature on the motor. So uh, bottom line is, people, until we can get NHTSA to, to change that regulation, um, I don't think we're going to be able to get remote activation of, of the windows with, uh, with the phone application. Now, um, somebody in the Twitter feed, let me just go through because we had some interesting, um, we had some interesting comments on this and, um, one of them came up was like, well, you know, what about with the car sensor suite? You know, like you have the ultrasonic sensors in the doors. There's a camera inside the car. I was just about to mention, what about yeah. the camera? Could that be used yeah. as a way to get around it? Sure. Well, think about it. I mean, if you have, ob you know, if, if we have an artificially intelligent computer in the car with object recognition, it should be able to recognize both inside and outside anything within proximity of the windows. It looks like a dog, a cat, a baby, a bird, whatever. If it, you know, if it detects a, something close to the window, theoretically, it should. It. Yeah, exactly. So I don't see why they wouldn't. But just like anything else, uh, Tesla would have to go to NHTSA and say, here's the detection system we have. Uh, we think it, you know, uh, makes the, the system sort of injury proof. If they agree, then they would open it up to say that anybody who has sensors that can detect the presence of objects in proximity to the windows would get an exemption for this. Um, but do you really think that's going to happen when they're like going 400 miles an hour trying to get robo taxis up and running next year? <laughs> I don't think they're going to be too keen to work on our robot windows. That's yeah, me. It's a matter of priorities. Eh? Yeah. So maybe when that's over, you know, like let's let's keep pestering, you know, one maybe one day we'll get it. But I'm not holding my breath until we uh, we see the big dog stuff uh, knocked off the list. OK. Any closing stuff before we get into viewer questions? Ooh, should I begin the rant now or hold Please it? Do. In? <laughs> do it. That was the segue for you. Eric. Do it. All right. So let me let me let me preface this for one thing. So if you if you are someone who is an environmentalist and um, you care very much about the planet, the human race, life on it, everything we know, <laughs> um, you've had some news in recent weeks where you started to kind of get grave concerns about the overall chances that we can curb our carbon emissions enough to try to avoid having a three to four degree centigrade increase in our global temperatures. Now we're seeing all around the world uh, effects of weather events where there's hurricanes occurring in earlier times of the year that are more intensive. We're seeing, um, uh, all kinds of uh, historical flooding, wildfires, everything. We, 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 it's, it's long storied what the impacts are um, that we have done on, on, on our planet. Earlier this week, I tweeted out a, a, a link to a story that uh, courtesy of Fred from Electric, where he had shared that Mercedes-Benz set a goal to be carbon neutral for passenger car fleet. So only their passenger cars, not their work vehicles or anything else. By 2039. Now, um, I'm not sure if we're going to, I'm going to try not to curse on this show. Um, <laughs> Family friendly. If I do, if I do, it might slip I'll one out. It out. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was sort of appalled reading the story for one great reason. So last year, um, there was a, a committee, the IPCC, which is essentially the, uh, the UN report that came out. And this is scientists and, and, uh, government agencies and just a whole slew of people putting their brains together to come out with a report that studies climate change and the lasting impacts in that report. Now we've talked about the report 
before on the show, but I'm going to mention now that at the time the report came out, which is in 2018, we had what they believed was 12 years to do a significant turnaround on how we humans are expending carbon dioxide to try to keep the change in temperature of our climate to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is half of the current target that we're on. So we're, we're, we're sort of on pace for three to four degrees. They're saying, look, we almost know it's going to be damn near impossible. But if we were to do half of that, between one and a half to two degrees centigrade, the report says, here's what the effects are of that change. And here's what we can try to do to circumvent it. So, you know, some of the, one of the details that uh, kind of was in there was like a 60% reduction in this and 40% in that. It's, it's just, it's, it's a big, big thing. But the Mercedes-Benz part is the thing that kind of got me going on a rant that day because then in the same week, we found out that for the first time in human history, not like ever, you know, in the last 10,000 years since we've done agriculture, ever, just ever in human history, before we ever knew we watched this earth, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is now 415 parts per million. So the highest ever. And we, we can measure this. We can track this. We have ice cores, and we just know. This is the first time ever in historical record that we've ever hit this mark. And we have political candidates across my country into Canada and here in the United States. I know that we've talked about it with what's happening with um, Ford in Toronto. We've talked about what some of the political candidates and what our current government's doing here in the U.S., um, we have a candidate for president, Joe Biden, who wants to find a middle ground climate policy. And my thing is, we don't have time to pussyfoot around. We don't have time for this kind of, well, let's not let's not go too hard too fast because it's going to be difficult. Um, mofos, we have to do something now. We have to do things now. And it's it is painful as it is. It's hard to sit back and to see people waste away such a precious resource that is our habitat. And what what I'm trying to understand from people, especially the Tesla haters and those that are it, look, if you're if you're out there damaging a car because you don't like what Elon said, you don't like what the cars stand for, you don't like electric cars altogether. I mean, whatever the reasons are that you want to destruct and deface property, shame on you. Because you wouldn't want that done to your car, whatever it is you drive, or to a window of your home, or you know, a member of your family. You just you wouldn't do that. So why why we continue attacking the very things that are trying to save us? Why companies who have a lot of leverage in decision making for public policy for those that are in positions of power uh, on boards of directors that are CEOs and the like? Why these people want to just kind of take the easy way to getting to electrifying their vehicles or to producing solar panel products or to having wind farms or whatever it is. I'm here kind of hearing this time and again, and I'm just baffled, baffled by why we're, we're, we're not being as aggressive as we have to be. I, look, I understand that a lot of this is really on um, local government. A lot of this is on, you know, um, public policy changes. A lot of it is on the public clamoring for it. Um, and it, it is difficult. Like, we, 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 have the, we have the physical resources. We have the technology. We know it exists. The, the problem now is what's the social and political approaches to implement those solutions that are going to get us where we need to be in the next now 11 years uh, for 2030. And so can we do these things? Yes, we can make these very drastic changes, but they have to be that. They have to be drastic. We have to stop wasting energy. We have to start um, reforming our, our energy grid. We have to do um, get as many gas cars off the road. I mean, we're seeing what our neighbors across the pond in Europe are doing in those democratic countries, having really smart policies 
and, and giving people the opportunities to not only afford these solutions, whatever they may be, but trying to at least get other people around them to buy in the idea that this is about all of us. And like, we can locally make a change here. We can have this recycling program. We can implement solar panels and roofing. We can give you these tax incentives, but they know they have to do that. They're going to spend the money necessary to get these programs in place because they have to. Because we, this is this is not something to f around with. So yeah, I'm pretty good. So we, we <laughs> so ideally the, the 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 thing I want people to who are listening to this podcast, who who are supporters of the show, or maybe you listen to us because you want to find something to rip us on. If you want to go on Twitter after the show and and you want to um, either give me accolades and commend me for this kind of thing, or you want to rip me a new one because you think it's all hogwash, have at it. Um, Let's have the conversation, but avoiding it is the biggest problem we can do outside of doing nothing. And at least it's a conversation. But I want I want people to understand you have power. Use your voice for the change that we need. Um, Get on your local officials. Really put policy forward. I mean, I was someone who ran for political office um, in uh, a city I lived in here in South Florida in 2018. And I didn't win the election. But the, the one public policy item. That was number one for me to focus on. It was not education. It was not infrastructure, which is all very important. It was climate change. Because here in South Florida, we are essentially target zero for this kind of problem. We're seeing what's happening in South Florida down in Miami, where on a sunny day, the streets flood because the tides are high. And we're, we're, we are on average about nine feet above sea level in Florida. And we are a wetland state. We're built on limestone. We have a lot of uh, floodings because of Lake Okeechobee. So it's it's we, we, it's like DEFCON 1 for us here. Mm-hmm. And people are slow playing and going, eh, we have time. We don't have time. The world is going to suffer and has been suffering, especially if, you, if there are impoverished nations. They're dealing with the brunt of this well before we have to because they can't do anything to stop it. So it's incumbent on us to do something. And I know this rains very long, and I'm so very sorry, but damn it, this this just pisses me off that people are choosing <laughs> to do nothing when when we have to do something. Every every day that we don't do something is a day that we're wasting. And it's it's. I mean, I'm I'm fearful as a 41 year old man what my generation will be left to deal with in the next 25 to 50 years, and heaven forbid what my kids would have to deal with or my grandkids i mean it's 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 on us we we the baby boomers had a great time like great get get the hell out of the way and let us actually do some stuff so that's it that's that's my rant for today appreciate that eric i uh, men oh man it just i feel your frustration you know yeah you know i know and i feel exactly the same way it it feels like you know, we have, we have too. There's too much politics involved. There's too much media involved. There's too much public confusion. It's mind blowing that it's a political issue. This is the strangest thing in most Western democracies. It has become a left versus right. I mean, how is that possible? It, cancer is 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 not you know a left versus right. Nuclear radiation, radiation poisoning, pollution should never be a political issue. It's a public oh. health issue, and it's the future of humanity. I don't know how this became politicized. It's well, I do, but I mean, it's astonishing to me that it still is. What What's happened, too, and this is is politically, we've seen a great divide between major political parties of, of nations abroad. I mean, this is not just a U.S. issue or no, a Canada issue. A lot of countries that have this. Um, we're seeing right-wing um, elections happen where people who should not even be running for office are running for office, and they're, for whatever reason... That one voice that people go, aha, that's that's different, that's refreshing, that's new, it's honest, and they vote for that. Um, you know, Brazil had an election not long ago that had a president elected that is essentially the Brazilian version of Trump here in the U.S. And he has policies that are so far out there, and Brazil is one of those precious resources that we can't afford to have mess around with the rainforest and all the different agriculture down there and and so we're, we're seeing, you know, people, and again, this is about power. When people are in positions of power and they're either uh, misinformed or not informed at all, and they have these really gregarious, arbitrary, you know, just sort of like apocalyptic policy ideas, and people are like, well, you know, that's, that's what so-and-so believe. Like, you, you, how? And part of it, too, 
it's on us, the electorate, to be informed. If if we if we hear that something just seems if like if it walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and quacks like you know it's probably a duck. Mm-hmm. So we we too often hear of these politicians who are spouting off these things that we know are inherently not true. We have to call it out. We have to say that's that's not true. And when scientists around the world are being ignored or discredited or being made a mockery of in a time where they can be the least afford I mean, look, it, there's clips going on on Twitter. If you guys watched um, last week tonight with John Oliver this past Sunday, oh, yeah. it's 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 a viral clip of uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, While well, granted, using foul language, but it proved a point. Like the world is on effing fire, and. It's the idea is that even he says, do we have any simple solutions? No. Are they free? No. But we we but to sit around and do nothing is is the biggest mistake we can make. And and it really is. And, and that's why I'm trying to I'm basically preaching for people. You, the people, have the power when you go vote, when you if after elections are done, you can write letters, you can go to your local council meetings. Um, you know, there's there's things that you can do to make it known what you want to see done. Um, you know, your utility companies are willing to listen to you. So every every decision you make, the products you buy, the re- resources you invest in, the things you choose to, um, if you're a stock investor, what you choose to buy stock in, all of that makes a, ch- a difference. The, the idea is that you have to understand you have that power. Don't always listen to the people who that are in a position to do it. Make that decision for yourself. But man, it's just every week I hear these things about, especially now for what we talk about with electric cars and car companies, you know, all these prototypes and like, it's great. It's great. It's great that you're trying to do something, but damn it. I would love an auto manufacturer to come out sometime next month and say, effective 2020, we are no longer building a gas car. Be bold, be abrasive, do something that's going to send the message that we're not here to F around. We're going to make a product that we know is all about the future of the human race. And we're going to make a damn good car and we're going to compete with Tesla and we're going to compete with Toyota. We're going to compete with whoever and put out a product that we believe in wholeheartedly is going to be one of the best damn cars out there. But I mean, just as again, t- I, I say pussyfoot because it's really the cleanest thing I can say right now, but it's like great, good for you, Mercedes Benz. I'm not even giving you a golf clap because that's a terrible idea. Why are you waiting so long? It's just, it's so aggravating. So aggravating. I think it's one of those things where change has to come from two parts it has to come from the populace. So we have choices now. You can put solar panels on, you can buy an electric car, you can buy LED light bulbs, you can do that type of thing. However, in this kind of climate, we also need a policy, much like a moonshot program, Mm -hmm. right? We need somebody in power to say, you know what? We're going to put our foot down and say, this is it. We're not spending $649 billion? How much is it? It's a lot. What are you talking about? The United States spends $649 billion a year to subsidize the fuel industry. Mm -hmm. So how fossil fuel. That's yeah. seventy-four million dollars an hour every hour for every single day to subsidize an industry whose emissions threaten all the life on the planet. I yep. tweeted that out. Yeah, it, it, take it's a pat- portion of that and put an energy policy in. You know, a sustainable energy policy in. Figure it out. It can be done. But the problem is, is that, man, yeah. it's it's, it's you political know? will. I, you're right, Trevor. You need to go back to something like. Uh, we need a Manhattan Project. We need a, ma- a combination of Manhattan Project and a policy like the moonshot. Let's do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's some money. Yeah, you and you think of the jobs you'd create because that's the other thing too is I'm very sympathetic to people who are, are trapped in these jobs. I mean, if you're in the oil industry or, or in coal mining, it's no joke. I mean, there are large swaths, regions, communities that are dependent on these industries for jobs. So I, I sort of understand where they're thinking like, you're going to take my livelihood away? Are you nuts? Like, no, that all has to be addressed. I mean, it has to be a bold plan that encompasses every aspect of this where you offer training to people to, to transition them into these new fields. But they're going to happen no matter what. So, I mean, you know, if, if, if our countries are not willing to step up and take the leader position and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and build these new industries and train people to, to work in them and give them hope as, as, as you know, to the to have a better future. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen. It has to it has to look at all aspects of it. I will say this, though, there is a little glimmer of hope in that our kids 
our kids are very highly attuned to this. Um, my kids yeah. very attuned to this stuff. Very much. They so understand, are. right? Yeah. They 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 get it. Uh, the problem is, is that they're at they're not they're not anywhere near at an age where they can actually make an impact that's actually required at this point. They're yeah. at least twenty twenty five years away. Uh, from yeah, being by, by the time in, they get to the age of power, it's going to be too late. It's, it's going to be too late. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, sad news all the way around. But uh, like I said, all you can do is do your part, and that's what I do. I try to make those choices every day uh, as best I can and try and talk to people, uh, you know, about that's, sustainable. That is key. To Eric's point, the, having the conversation is key. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe, someone I tremendously respect, is always saying that on her Facebook page, on Twitter, whatever else. I mean, she's an amazing communicator on, on climate science. And she says it's the number one thing you can do. But above and beyond, like taking personal action and voting, have the conversation because it yeah. just doesn't happen. I talk to people in the office all the time and 90% of them are completely unaware of the gravity of the situation just because no one talks about it. Just have the conversation, do some research, read up on it. And, and, and part of it, I think, is also, and I'll kind of end up with this, is that, you know, climate activists are doing a great, great job getting policies done everywhere. I mean, we're seeing uh, the young lady Thornburg, um, who uh, was a Nobel Prize candidate for her for her work that she's doing. Um, and there's, again, countless people everywhere doing something. Uh, we had the Sunrise Movement. That's a large group that's putting out some good policy ideas out there. The simplest thing that we can do is start the conversation. Because even if you, for example, I mean, I'm someone who I have recycle bins off to my left that I make here at home because my community does not recycle here. Um, my office does not recycle there. So I will actually take uh, materials that I can recycle home with me. Um, I have a nearby recycling plant that I go to where I drop off stuff from my house. I'm doing my part, but I also live in a place where I know hundreds of other tenants don't do that. So it's, it's difficult to understand that for as much work as I and you and many of our listeners are doing in their communities, it's, it's barely putting a ripple in a very large pond. And, but doing nothing, having the apathy of just saying, eh, what can I do? It's not, no, you have to do something. And at the very least, talking about it, encouraging yep. others to do stuff, trying to get your, I mean, look, I, I would love if I can get my company to start doing something with recycling, even if it means me hauling in the back of my Model 3 and taking it. Like, how great is that? Going, look at this guy recycling in an electric car, you know? But even the idea of how we charge our cars, are we using fossil fuels to charge the very vehicles that we're trying to drive to not contribute to the carbon emissions? So the, all of this really is, it's a, it's a very large problem and, and it's not insurmountable. But man, I just, when I, like I said, when I hear news of this stuff and I see people coming down hard on Tesla with the stock prices and what Elon does, I'm like, y'all need to just get a life. And take that same energy you're putting into that, into doing something noble and good and worthwhile. Because you're really wasting my goddamn time. <laughs> Goodness. Oh, well, we can always count on Eric for speaking his mind. It's about coding cars. Can we go back? To <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Viewer well, questions, everybody. Yes, yes. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're going a little bit long here, so we really have to get into right. the viewer questions and listener questions. This is a conversation we can continue to have, mm -hmm. and we will continue to have. So um, feel free to chime in if you want, uh, you know, on Twitter or whatever, into the question comments and stuff. If there's something that, uh, that you know, you think needs to be addressed or whatever you want us to talk about, let us know. So having said that, let's get in here. Um, we have quite a number of questions here, but I may have to skip a few. First one comes from uh, Fred. He says, do you think Tesla will ever offer Spotify? Do you think Tesla will enable more app features as in uh, view cameras and sentry mode control windows? Uh, the Spotify thing is available in Europe, in, in Canada, and in, well, actually here in North America. We have to use, um, what is it? TuneIn. TuneIn yeah. yep. and Slacker. And Slacker. Both of them are kind of horrible, if you ask me. Um, there is um, a, a runaround or, or workaround for Spotify. If you have a Spotify account, um, there is a link, and I, I don't have it right handy right now, but I will put it in the show description um, for you guys so you can bring up a special um, browser uh, 
website in the browser where we'll actually uh, tie into your Spotify app and you can actually stream from your Spotify account on your mobile phone into the car. So it's a workaround for now. I do hope that Tesla does offer it officially in North America. I think it's just a licensing thing at this point. It's probably something they have an arrangement with uh, with Slacker and TuneIn for the, for the amount of time. Who knows when the, the licensing agreement changes, whatever. They can totally change this in the future. Matter of fact, I was, mad, I was able to get into through some help of some technicians that I know, uh, get into the diagnostics page of my Tesla. And there, if I remember correctly, there's an there's a button for Spotify, but it's not live anywhere in the system. So I'm hoping that they, they do that. Okay, moving along. Um, Stuart asks, given the recent acts of vandalism caught on Sentry mode, what is the best specification for the USB, thus eliminating the time gaps between recordings? Well, uh, first thing you need to know is that uh, none of the Teslas have USB 3 ports. They're all USB 2. So the speed, yeah, you got to make sure it's at least USB 2. I recommend for Sentry mode and the dash cam at least 32 gigabytes. Uh, that should be sufficient for most people. I know people are trying to put things like uh, one terabyte. Somebody was just, um, there is a um, micro SD card now you can buy. It's about $450 on Amazon. Uh, one terabyte. And you can put that in a little adapter and plug it in through USB. So if you want to have lots and lots and lots of footage, you can certainly do that. So speed uh, is not really that uh, that relevant. If you have a Model 3, it's a little, you know, it's not really that much of an issue. If you have an older S or an X like I do, uh, the the gaps between recording of the clips is several you know, three, four seconds sometimes. So uh, you just have to live with it. Either that or buy yourself a good dash cam. But as far as Sentry's mode is concerned, um, yeah, uh, we should see some some improvements with that shortly. Anyways, moving on. Uh, Rich asks, uh, when does Ian expect to have his Model Y variant of the Evolve t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, Ian. Yeah, Ian, what's what's doing, man? Oh, man, I'm sorry. No, I know people want this thing. I, I just, wall to wall, I, I worked two weeks straight. I had then you know the event on the weekend i I, there's house things i have to do Mm. i just run ragged i'm so sorry but uh, give it a week to 10 days hopefully that'll be up and on the site i uh i just got the graphic image the other day i just got to tune it all up and we'll we'll get it up there i promise okay awesome well there you go thanks for uh for writing in rich so keep an eye uh, uh posted on that next question comes from my friend uh oh anthony um tesla milton how you doing tony uh, he asks, uh, this is related to some tweets that we shared in this past week. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tesla's tendency to replace parts at the component or assembly level when resolving warranty issues, specifically when the issue is being fixed as minor cosmetic in nature, as opposed to simply repairing the existing component? Overkill or best to replace the whole assembly to propagate hardware design changes? Look, I'm going to bring up a graphic here. This is a common thing on a lot of Model 3s. The, drivers, the, the drive stock, the little cap on the top, Earlier cars, and I haven't looked at the latest ones, but a lot of earlier cars had a problem with the adhesive, and that little plastic cap on the top comes a little bit loose. Now, some people have pulled it off, put their own adhesive on, fixes the problem. If you call Tesla and serve, you know, and they send out a service technician, they don't re-glue the cap on. They do this. They, they change the whole stock and assembly in there, which leads us to you know, what he's talking about, why would they do that? Can't they just re-glue it on rather than changing the whole component? And I agree, I think it's overkill. However, the plus side of this, though, too, is that they get to see what the actual root of the problem is, take those parts back, and re-engineer them. I mean, we know that Tesla has a closed-loop system. They're very, very tight as far mm-hmm. as redesigning. They have physical engineers in glass booths right in the middle of the factory for designing parts on the fly. So... It seems excessive right now, and I would agree. And again, early production on these cars, you're going to have a lot of problems and a lot of parts are going to have to be redesigned as they go. It's just how Tesla does things because they don't test their cars for two years. When it's ready, they put it on the market and then they fix them as they go. So it's something you have to accept. Um, but hopefully we're, we're seeing a little less of this stuff. I mean, there were a bunch of parts that were replaced on the early cars. I mean, we had things like headlights, taillights, um, some there were some other problems too. This, while well, this drive stock, I've seen lots of Model 3s and stuff. So I, I'm seeing less of this now, uh, but I agree. Um, if, if it was my case, I wouldn't make a service call for something like that. I would actually glue it on myself. So, all right. Thank you for the question, Anthony. <laughs> all right. Uh, moving on here, Serge, he says, um, in my region, Montreal, 
He says the speed limits shown in the Tesla 3 are, dis are different from the true speed limits displayed on the, on the signs on the road. Shouldn't the car cameras read the signs? Can we report issues so the database gets updated? Seems important for us to gain trust in the autopilot. Well, right now, the cars do not use the cameras to read the speed signs. They largely come from the Google Maps that are in the car. Um, so at this point, I'm going to say that it's just an error in the Google Maps system. Um, my Lincoln that I had did both. Um, it would pull it from the GPS or the map system. Um, otherwise, it would read the speed signs. So it's just a matter of time before Tesla gets around to training the system to actually use the cameras. Right now, they're using the map. So if you see it, I don't know if there's a way to report it. I have suggested in the past to use the voice, the bug report feature to, to, to send it in. I don't know whether Tesla is actively um, filtering those out, but it's worth a try. Yeah, so. I've had the same. I've had the same problem. The sometimes I'm like, the speed limit is not 45 here; it's 30. But thanks for playing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, like I said, use the bug report report feature to report it. Uh, maybe Tesla updates it, uh, but I, I don't know what the true answer to this is at this point. Other than we know the cameras don't read the uh, the sign. So thanks for sending that in, Serge. Uh, let's see here. The next question comes from Frank. It says, is there a difference to the health of the battery if I let my battery discharge from 80 to 20% about four days and then recharge back to 80% or should I just top it up every night? Uh, no, it doesn't hurt. Um, again, battery cycles are just what they are. Um, if you have the ability to top your battery up every night, I would recommend you actually do that because there are diagnostics and things and electronics and stuff that it needs to do to the car. Um, literally Tesla's designed these batteries and the charging mechanism. It's like literally fire and forget. Just plug it in. Let the car take care of everything. Don't overthink it. So anything you guys want to add? No, I agree. Yeah. yeah I, it's been, you know, if you read right in the manual, it just says anytime you can plug it in, plug it in. Yeah. And then the general consensus is between 80 and 90%. 80% seems to be the, the, the sweet spot. So just yeah. keep her at eight. She's happy. If you can plug it in, leave it alone. Yeah. Oh. Not okay. bad if you don't, but better if you do. Yeah. Uh, next question comes from Spencer. It says, with the $400 price increase on all models, does this mean the Model 3 no longer is no longer no longer eligible, <laughs> tongue-tied, is no longer eligible for the federal rebate in Canada? Does the SR Plus still qualify? So, yes. Spencer, the answer is, is no, because the prices have not increased in Canada. Not yet, anyways. Um, and yes, the SR Plus and uh, it, it basically were unaffected. So the car still still uh, still qualify. It's not yeah. an issue. And not to panic if it does, because people don't realize it shows up as fifty nine nine ninety. Sorry, uh, fifty four nine ninety. Correct. But that includes the the destination charge and transport, which doesn't count. So the car is actually fifty three. What is it? Four or something like that. Yeah. So if it went up to fifty three eight. The car would still qualify with with exactly. people allowed to go over fifty five with the transport. Yeah. So I think at this point, if there's a price increase right now, as far as we can tell, Tesla's oh. eating it for Canada. Yeah, and we'd still be okay. Okay. Uh, last question of the night. I know we're going a little long here. We're going to try and wrap this up here. It comes from Chris. He says, Elon stated that there are new features coming for Sentry Mode. Do you think one of those features will automatically turn off Sentry Mode when my uh, phone key gets close to my car? Now, that particular feature, I don't know, but I will bring up a tweet that Tesla or Tesla, Elon said that is coming. Uh, why is this not coming up? <laughs> oh, no, are you going to do this to me again? I know. Let's do this. There it is. There's the tweet. New Sentry Mode options will be always exclude home, exclude work, exclude safe, sa saved locations, ask or off. We don't know when they're coming, but those are some of the new features that will be added. So not related to your phone, but some of them are location aware. So I hope that answers your question as far as sentry mode is concerned. Uh, we hope to see those uh, fairly soon. Again, uh, I, well, wait a second. We did see an inkling of that in 2019.16. So there's a chance it may make it in there. Um, otherwise, we may have to wait a little bit longer on some of those. I'm looking forward to that because I try to remember to turn on uh, sentry mode on my car whenever I have it parked. I don't always remember. It would be nice to have it set to say something like always or um, one of those other features. So that brings us to the end of the questions. Thank you, you uh, everyone for sending them in. <laughs> can, I, can I add one tiny little last maintenance uh, thing that I discovered? It was cool. Okay, go ahead. Um, after I got my car, uh, just going into winter, I discovered that my headlights were not perfectly aligned and I was so thrilled to find in the maintenance. Uh, yes, you maintenance can do that. Car. 
you can yep. adjust the headlights. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what version I was on at the time, but for months afterwards, it wouldn't actually work on my car. It was locked out. Oh. I think there was some reason Tesla said why they had done that. Anyway, I, I hadn't touched it up until about a week ago, and I tried it again, and I know at least on um, 2019.8.5, it now works. I sat there, much to my joy, in the garage, and I was able to adjust the headlights. So for any of you who want to get a little bit more, or just align your headlights, or adjust them in any way, you seem to be able to do that once again. So just, just a little factoid for any of you that wanted to play with that. Well, that's always good to know. Well, before we sign off, I just want to remind everyone, there is a mission tonight. Well, of course, most of you who are going to be listening uh, won't be able to, uh, to to see it, but SpaceX has a mission, so we're going to try and sign off here, and we can watch this sure. live. It'll be go. the heaviest SpaceX payload ever at 18 and a half tons, launching 60 satellites, which will generate more power than the ISS and deliver a terabit of bandwidth to Earth. Can't wait. What? Bring it, son. <sighs> I think eventually Tesla is going to be able to tie into the system and give us some really cool features in the car. I really hope anyways. So software updates? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Without having to be tied to Wi-Fi, maybe. Anyways. That would be fantastic. Wouldn't yeah. it? Oh, man. Well, listen, Eric, since you're on the screen, where can people find this if they want to have a chat with you? Uh, you guys can yell at me on Twitter at handle ECFIX. That's E-C-F-I-X. My thanks to all my new followers. I hope I keep you there. Awesome. Here, how about you, Ian? Where can people find you? Uh, at Ian Pavelko on Twitter. Uh, Matt Hungarian is the handle on the uh, Tesla Owners Online forum. And uh, if you're looking for Evolveware uh, or uh, perhaps a uh, weapon of mass adoption. Yes. Um, bug, whatever. Mm -hmm. Any sort of fan, you can find me at uh, teespring.com, Matt Hungarian Evolveware. Link will be in the video description. You guys can check it out. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. As usual, you can follow me on Twitter. The handle's at Model3Owners. Check out the forum at teslaownersonline.com. And if you like the show and you'd like to uh, help us out a little bit, check out the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Model3OwnersClub. Yes, I'm not changing the URL. I keep saying that, but uh, oh well. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> we appreciate all the support from all of our phone from our, uh, our, our Patreon supporters. It really helps. And uh, lastly, big thank you to our three sponsors. That's Evan X, the guys at Fine Lab, and of course, Dula Van Insurance. Mm -hmm. We will catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening and watching wherever you happen to be. We'll see you next time. See you guys. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.